Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the reactions of organolithium compounds. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I assigned last lecture. In this first example, I give you this ketone with this ketal as well, and I ask you to propose a Grignard reagent for the following transformation. So in this transformation, what we look for is a bond disconnection. So what we call this is a retrosynthetic disconnection. We're looking at the final product of the molecule, and we're looking between that and a starting material, what possible disconnection could be made, so we prepare that compound. So here I've colored it such that you can see which piece comes from the cyclohexanone and which piece comes from a Grignard. So the Grignard that I've chosen to use in this case is this naphthalene magnesium bromide species, although you could use other magnesium halides if you'd like. In this next example, we first take this uh, aldehyde here and we have to treat it with some sort of Grignard reagent. And so once again, we do a retrosynthetic disconnection and here I've colored the right portion of the molecule orange and the left portion of the molecule green. And you can see that we are using vinyl magnesium bromide. And so it's good to remember that you can get an allylic alcohol by adding a vinyl Grignard to an aldehyde. So this is a useful synthetic disconnection to be familiar with. Now in the third example, uh, we had this cubane ester, and I asked you to show the mechanism of this reaction as well as predict the product. And so here, first we take this ester, and it coordinates magnesium, as is normally the case for Grignard reactions. We have a coordination of Lewis acid. We then have the shift of the methyl group to the carbonyl carbon. This allows the electrons to collapse onto the oxygen. The electrons are able to collapse back down, eliminating ethoxide as a leaving group, which forms this intermediate ketone. Now, if you recall, ketones are more electrophilic than esters. So what's going to happen? A second Grignard reagent is going to add to this. So again, we get the carbonyl coordinating the magnesium. We have a shift of the methyl group and then the elimination of the magnesium. This alkoxide upon workup affords the tertiary alcohol, and this would be the product of this reaction, this cool looking tertiary alcohol. Okay, so before we start today, I thought it would be useful to introduce some different trifluoromethyl reagents. So just like Grignard reagents are good nucleophilic carbon, carbon bond forming reagents, if we want to add very fluorinated uh, carbons, we have to use specialized reagents. And so one that's been developed for the addition to carbonyls is Rupert Prakash reagent. And Prakash is a really cool guy. He works in uh, uh, California, really great guy to work for. Uh, talk to him at a ton of conferences, really cool guy. So this reagent usually will afford the TMS protected alcohol as the product, although depending on reaction conditions, you can get the alcohol product just as is. Now, if you want to, instead of add, adding a nucleophilic CF3, if you want to add an electrophilic CF3, you can use this reagent called Tony reagent. So this is a variant of Tony reagent called Tony acid reagent. This is actually prepared from Rupert Prakash reagent, although this provides more of a CF3 plus rather than a CF3 minus. And depending on your application, you might use different variants of this reagent. Now, one other approach is to use a radical CF3 source. And so this is something called Langlois reagent. And this can be uh, activated using certain oxidants or photochemical conditions, which then liberates a CF3 radical. And so all three of these reagents have been quite uh, important in the development of modern fluorine chemistry. And so with that, let's get to today's material, organolithium reagents. So we talked about Grignard's last lecture, but in addition to magnesium containing organometallics, we can have lithium containing organometallics. Now, while Grignard's are commonly prepared in laboratories, they're still kind of a pain to prepare, but almost nobody prepares organolithiums in a laboratory setting using lithium metal. And part of the reason for this is lithium metal is very hard to deal with, partially because it reacts with nitrogen gas. So if you leave lithium in the presence of nitrogen, you'll get lithium amide, LiN3, or Li3N rather. And so if you want to work with lithium, you have to work in an argon, argon glove box, which not every laboratory has, so it can be a bit of a challenge to work with. So most of the time what people do is they get a solution of N-butyl lithium in a solvent such as hexanes, and then they work with that and they transmetallate. So there's a lot of different reactions you can do with organolithiums. They have different selectivity than Grignard reagents do. Most of the time, Grignard reagents will do one, two additions to carbonyls. They will do some other chemistry. Organomagnesium can do a few other reactions, but organolithiums have a much wider scope of reactivity. So you could take, for instance, some sort of CH compound and deprotonate it, 
or you could take a C halogen compound, that would get converted to an alkyl lithium or aryl lithium, vinyl lithium, depending on what kind of compound it is. Alternatively, it could still do one, two addition. Usually if that happens, it's gonna to be to aldehydes or ketones, but it depends. So if you want reliable one, two addition, most of the time you're gonna use Grignard chemistry. So in this first example, we do see an example of 1,2 addition to a carbonyl on this vinyl stannane. A stannane is just a tin-containing compound. And here we can see a regioselective addition of the methyl group to this carbonyl so that they only are afforded with one product. If you're interested in that, there's a, a good review here in the Electronic Encyclopedia of Reagents for Organic Synthesis that talks about the broader use of methyl lithium. Another thing you can do is you can take an alkyne and deprotonate it with N-butyl lithium. So this is one way we would prepare an uh, alkyne lithium in the lab. This alkyne lithium is now a great nucleophile, and so it can engage in SN2 reactions. So it can displace a primary bromide, for instance. And then we get this interesting enine. It's an ene because there's an alkene, and it's an ine because there's an alkyne. Now the reason that N-butyl lithium works to deprotonate this is because it's 25 orders of magnitude difference in acidity which even though they are both CHs, that's a hell of a big difference in uh, acidity. So this is easy for N-butyl lithium to deprotonate, like walk in the park. The difference between like this alkane CH, which would be the, the pKa of butane versus the pKa of this acetylene is the difference between the acidity of this acetylene and like, like sulfuric acid, which is pretty, pretty big difference. So quite a big difference. Um, so one of the other reactions that can happen is CH lithiation. And so sometimes when we think about metals, we think about them as ionic, but both in the case of magnesium and in lithium, we call them organometallics to kind of like illustrate that they're not quite ionic. They're pretty covalent. And if you look at lithium on the periodic table, it's only element three. So it's quite small. So when we lithiate a position, it is somewhat covalent. It isn't entirely an ionic interaction. In fact, it's probably more covalent than ionic. And the selectivity of lithiation reactions often depends on the presence of directing groups. So in this case, this mom group is likely helping direct the lithiation to this CH over the rest of the CHs on this quinoline core. So in this case, they lithiate that position and then they trap it with an electrophile, which in their case is trimethylsilylated. So you could trap this with all sorts of different electrophiles. You could trap it with a carbonyl. You could trap it with a halogenating agent such as N-bromosuccinamide. Um, you could have a field day with disulfides to make thioethers. There's a lot of choices available. So uh, you can also use the same base and depending on the conditions, get different selectivity. So in this case, this is likely just the kinetic product. Usually lithiations are kinetically determined. So what position gets deprotonated the fastest? And sometimes you might need to screen different lithium containing bases to determine which would most easily be able to deprotonate the position you want. You can also add in different additives or solvents to impact site selectivity. So one common combination is the use of an alkyl lithium with tetramethyl ethylene diamine and what that does is it separates the lithium from the, the alkyl anion. So that would be more anionic, and that's a way stronger base. And sometimes you can deprotonate multiple CHs on the same molecule that are like not that acidic, relatively speaking. So the go-to base that we typically use is N-butyl lithium, as I was illustrating earlier. So here we can see this case where we have a furan-containing substrate, which undergoes lithiation at the two position, um, this can then be trapped with an electrophile. And so in this case, they trapped it with paraformaldehyde. Paraformaldehyde is just a polymer of formaldehyde. And so it can attack at the carbon and displace part of the polymer as a leaving group. The reason this is used is formaldehyde on its own isn't very stable. It tends to polymerize, hence paraformaldehyde. So when we do low temperature deprotonations, we tend to favor uh, reactivity as a base. When we start seeing higher temperature reactions, we start seeing more reactivity as a nucleophile, although a lot of chemistry is possible with N-butyl lithium, and so a lot of the time it's kind of just mix it together, see what happens, try common conditions that work for similar things. So in this case, we have this dibromo difluorobenzene, and one of the things organolithiums can do is act as a halogen abstractor. And so this is just the N-butyl acting as a nucleophile at bromide rather than at carbon. 
So normally we would think about like attack at carbon, displacement of bromide, something like that. But in this case, the N-butyl will actually attack at bromide. And so we would just call that a halogen abstractor or a transmetallation. So it's transmetallation because the lithium is the metal. It used to be on butane. Now the lithium has been transferred to this other carbon. So the metal has gone from one molecule to another. So it's been transmetallated. Here, this is an aryl bromide, but this also works for vinyl halides, alkyl halides as well. One example of an alkyl halide lithiation is this cyclopropyl dibromide. This can be lithiated to form the monolithio monobromo cyclopropyl species. And so most of the time, if you have a bromide, iodide, sometimes chloride, you can undergo lithiations very easily. Although fluorides tend to be harder to lithiate, although there's some people who push the limits of chemistry and try and lithiate them anyway. So for the practice for this lecture, there's two problems, three problems I'd like to assign. First, given the following reaction conditions with this starting material, what product are you afforded with? And like, what role does the N-butyl lithium play? Is it a base? Is it acting as a transmetallation reagent? What's it doing? Additionally, in this problem, I'd like you to identify what the product of this reaction would be. So if you've been following through the lectures so far, you'd know what purpose this uh, reagent n iodosuccinamide would serve as. And the question is, what kind of product would we get here? In this final example, I've shown an example of the cori seebach reaction, which is a very, very useful reaction in organic synthesis. And so I want you to propose conditions that would convert this dithiane, this dithioketal, or acetal rather, into this dithioketal product. And so with that, I hope this has been a really useful lecture for you on lithiation reactions and the reactivity of organolithiums. If you have any questions or comments about this, please leave them in the, in the comment section. And if you have any criticism or comments about how the series is going, I'd be happy to hear them. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you.